Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, GMP Cleanup Routine Environmental Monitoring in 21 CFR Part 11 Data Integrity. I am Michelle Ashton of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots and brought to you by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit Beckman.com. Let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want and any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credit. I'd like to now present today's speaker, Tony Harrison, the Senior Marketing Manager at Beckman Coulter. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Tony, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, my name's Tony Harrison. I'm a senior manager with Beckman Coulter, and it's my responsibility globally uh, to look after our GMP quality control environmental monitoring products. Now, before we start today, I'd like to share a, a, with you a quote uh, from the World Health Director General. I'm sure that quote will resonate with all of us, uh, particularly at this time of the COVID pandemic. So this is the agenda for today's presentation. I'll touch on uh, the GMPs and the World Health Organization rules and regulations for clean rooms, and also reference the uh, ISO standard for clean rooms, ISO 14644-1. And then I'll go on to talk about the difference between clean room classification and routine monitoring, because I often see that uh, people get confused between the two. And then um, line up the uh, data integrity challenges that routine environmental monitoring provides for us. Uh, and finally, the last point in the presentation today, I'll show how if we can automate that routine environmental monitoring, we can actually improve our chances of good data integrity. So first of all, let's take a look at the GMPs and the World Health Organization for Clean Rooms and the ISO standard. Now, as I said, we're all aware right now um, of the search for the COVID vaccine and the pharmaceutical industry, of course, is racing to find the best solution for us. And vaccines, of course, are delivered by injection, like many uh, pharmaceutical products. And any parenteral or injectable drug is of course the biggest risk for us if they get contaminated because if they are injected sorry they are injected directly into the human body and when they do that they bypass our defenses and any microbial contamination uh, will cause an infection and possibly blood poisoning or sepsis and maybe eat death this is an extreme example or one of our probably our most vulnerable and weak um, patients who receive parental treatment. Um, it's a premature baby. Uh, their immune system is immunocompromised. Um, they can't feed from the mother. And we have to, of course, feed them and give them their medications using intravenous drip bags, which contain the total parental nutrition as well as the, the balance of drugs that they need to keep them alive. Now, if any contamination gets into these TPN bags, then it will cause, unfortunately, almost certain death uh, for the baby. It's got no defenses at all. And in fact, there's been several cases around the world where this has happened. And um, sadly, babies on the premature birth um, wards have actually died because of contamination in the TPN bags. 
And that's why we make injectables or parental products in clean rooms in order to minimize the risk of contamination. So here's a recent, fairly recent example of what happens when clean room contamination control goes wrong. In 2012 in North America, the manufacturing clean room of a small compounding company became contaminated with a spore forming fungus, which found its way into the drug product. Now this particular product they were making was a strong painkiller, which is delivered to the patient via direct injection into the spinal cord. Now 17,000 vials were sadly contaminated by this event. 64 people died from, meningi from meningitis as the fungus invaded their nervous system and made the um, membranes around the brain swell. And 750 more people were infected and there's no cure for this very painful infection. So if we don't control the contamination, this is the sort of thing that can happen. So um, those who are involved in routine environmental monitoring will notice that we actually, of course, monitor particles in the air, not for bacteria. And the reason for that is that the biggest challenge for contamination is the, the workers uh, present in the clean rooms. The average human being is around 100,000 billion bacteria on and inside their body. And we shed over 30,000 skin cells per hour. In fact, we shed and replace our entire skin every month. Now, each of these skin cells is smaller than the human eye can see, but it carries many microbes which could fall into and contaminate the pharmaceutical products. In fact, we shed somewhere in the region of 3.6 kilos of skin cells per year. So the uh, GMP rules and regulations, of course, in North America, the CGMP document uh, covers many aspects of drug manufacturing and gives best advice on practices in sterile manufacturing uh, as well. The European and the World Health share the same GMP, Annex 1, and this defines acceptable levels of airborne particulate contamination for clean rooms for sterile drug manufacturing. And both of these GMPs, the European and the North American and the World Health one, they all call up the ISO standard, ISO 14644-1, for the methodology of clean room classification. So let's take a look at the GMP regulations controlling the contamination levels in these clean rooms. Now this is the current table for air particle contaminations in the European uh, GMP Annex 1 and also it's the same in the guide for sterile manufacturing from the World Health Organization. You can see there are four grades of clean room defined from the very cleanest, the grade A, through to the dirtiest grade D. <clears throat> You can also see that this European GMP calls for two particle sizes to be measured and reported, both 0.5 micron particles and 5 micron particles. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now this is the same the world over except for the North American CGMP, which only calls for 0.5 micron particles to be measured and reported. All particle counters <clears throat> report in particles per cubic meter and you can see here we're reporting at rest and in operation. Now, because we're reporting particles per cubic meter, this can present an area for potential error for our uh, routine environmental monitoring program because the sample taken at each location is often just one minute. Um, and with a one cubic foot per minute counter, this one minute sample means that the sample volume taken is just one cubic foot of air. And there are approximately 35.2 cubic feet in a cubic meter of air. So the customers must, sorry, so the users must multiply the count results by 35.2 to get counts per cubic meter. Now, of course, most particle counters can be programmed to automatically make this calculation for the user. but it's another configuration step that the user has to remember to do to ensure re results are reported correctly. And I've seen it sometimes where users fail to do that and they're incorrectly reporting their results. 
So as I mentioned, people are the biggest source of contamination in the clean room environment. So of course, the workers in clean rooms have to pass through several different classes of clean room to enter the production suite. Each area is, of course, separated by an airlock, and this minimizes the flow of air from the dirtier outer rooms into the clean production areas. And of course, particle counters, after, as they move through the rooms, have to be sanitized as they pass through each grade of clean room to another. And this is typically done by spraying them with an industrial alcohol called IPA. Now, the dirtiest room is the grade D, and staff are required to change out of their outdoor clothes here and into the clean room clothes. They then pass through to the grade C preparation area where the equipment used in production is prepared. And finally, quite normally, they are required to change their clothes again as they pass into the production area. Now, generally, the grade A production filling area is protected by a barrier system either an isolator or restricted access barrier or RAB system. And this prevents the workers from entering into the grade A area and thus minimizing the chances of contamination. Uh, and in the case of uh, environment around the area being uh, grade C, for that, if there's a barrier in place. Now, if there isn't a physical barrier in place around the filling zone, then the background to the grade A must be grade B quality air. So let's take a look at the North American CGMP document. Now this differs to the European and the World Health Guidance in that it only mentions one particle size, the 0.5 micron particle. However, it should be borne in mind that any uh, manufacturer based in North America wanting to uh, sell their products outside of North America to anywhere else in the world, they'll have to count both the 0.5 and 5 microns as they must be in compliance with the standards of the country in which they want to export their products. In the middle of the search for a vaccine cure for COVID-19, that's the very disease, of course, that's keeping us all at home and forcing us to have a virtual life, um, this, the vaccine manufacturing plants are, in fact, a rather unique subset of the biopharma production in that production of a vaccine is usually done, of course, by cultivating high concentrations of the disease-causing pathogen in bioreactors. They're optimized for cell health, but also they unfortunately will support microbial growth and proliferation at the same time. Now this gives manufacturers additional challenges over and above other manufacturers of, of injectable drug products. Extra care must be taken to avoid contamination bacteria from the production staff from getting into the bioreactors because they'll proliferate. And at the same time, great care must be taken not to allow any of the pathogen itself from cross-contaminating contaminating other products which may be manufactured in separate clean rooms in the same facility. Hence, vaccine production lines and the staff and equipment working on them are usually kept separated to avoid and prevent contamination. This means they can't move particle counters from one clean room to the next because the particle counter may be carrying some of the pathogen and that causes a risk of cross-contamination into the second clean room. And these challenges are so well known that the World Health Organization have a dedicated guidance specifically for environmental monitoring of clean rooms in vaccine manufacturing facilities. Now, I mentioned already that both the European GMP and the North American CGMP uh, tell the reader to refer to the classification procedures laid down in the ISO standard, ISO 14644-1. Now, the ISO standard is not a GMP document and is actually designed to give guidance rather than mandate. But the fact that it is referenced by the GMPs gives it the same status as a GMP document for those manufacturers regulated. Now, the ISO standard has a wide range of clean room classes covering particle sizes from 0.1 to 5 microns and the number of particles per cubic meter for each, meter for each class is defined in the table itself. Now the idea is that the user must decide what particle sizes they're interested in and how clean the clean room must be and then they choose a subset of the clean room class and particle size from the ISO table. GMP has decided the particle sizes of interest are 0.5 and 5 microns. And you can see for grade B at rest, the number of particles match 
exactly the ISO 5 in grade. An important thing to note in, in the 2015 version of this ISO standard, it doesn't specify the number of particles at 5 microns for ISO class 5. However, users who are regulated to the European GMP or World Health GMP must comply with the GMP rules and so they are required to measure 5 micron particles as well. So the fact they're no longer mentioned in the ISO standard doesn't mean that you don't have to measure them if you're following EU GMP or World Health Organization GMP, you still have to monitor them. All right, so that's the um, rules and regulations. Um, so let's take a look now um, at the different uh, classrooms, uh, sorry, clean rooms and classification and routine monitoring. So they're two very different things, classification and monitoring. Portable particle counts, of course, are use of both application. Um, and the first is classification, of course, very different from monitoring, as I said. And the classification process is defined very clearly in the ISO standard. Whereas it's the responsibility of the user to define the routine environmental monitoring program specific to their own production process, product, and the clean room. So this absence of any specific guidance for routine monitoring locations and frequencies often leads the user to um, wonder what they should be doing. And they, the user themselves have to take ownership of the decision where the environmental monitoring is done routinely. Um, and it must be based on a risk assessment of their specific production process, their product and the clean room itself. Now, clean room classification focuses on the clean room itself. So in this classification, we're not looking at risk to the product. We're just trying to check that the clean room itself is performing to the target cleanliness class. Now, it's very well described in ISO 14644-1 and typically carried out every six or 12 months, depending on your standard operating procedure. Now, this is just a, an example um, of a clean room here. It's not meant to be prescriptive, but you can see how the ISO standard tells the user to calculate the correct number of, of locations according to the size of the clean room. And then it tells the user to lay the sampling locations out in an evenly distributed grid pattern across the room. According to the ISO standard, there's no requirement to take a sample where the product is at risk of airborne contamination because it's just checking the room itself. In this example, following the ISO standard means that there are no samples taken in the areas where product may, may be at risk. For instance, the descrambler table, the filling zone, the stopping zone, or the capping station itself. Now we come to clean room environmental monitoring. Now for monitoring, there are no hard and fast rules, just that the user must make a risk assessment of where the product may be exposed to airborne contamination in the manufacturing process and set sampling locations at these points for their routine environmental monitoring program. So if we now take another look at the example I just gave for clean room classification, in this theoretical example, if we now look at monitoring, the user has taken a look at their manufacturing process and decides on those locations where the product may be at risk and laid out their sampling program appropriately. And you'll notice that these sampling locations for routine environmental monitoring are in very different locations to those used for classification. So please avoid uh, using the same locations as you do for classification, for routine monitoring. It's not how it should be done. So this whole uh, webinar is about class clean room monitoring and um, data integrity challenges that it provides. So let's take a look at that whole process. Now, of course, as we well know, routine environmental monitoring in clean rooms is typically a very manual process involving the collection of thousands of samples each month using portable particle counters. 
Typically, there are very many manual SOP steps to be followed in the typical routine environmental monitoring program. And the first step, of course, is for the technician to make sure that you're using the correct version of the environmental monitoring SOP. Then, as they follow the sampling map in the SOP, they have to go to each sample location and then manually type the location name into the particle counter via an on-screen keyboard. And next, they have to configure the counter to sample for the correct amount of time and for the correct number of samples according to the SOP for each location. And most people standardize on the same sampling for every location, but in some cases, different sample locations are used and uh, so the, the counter configuration has to change. And next, they print the sample results from each location from the counter and handwrite comments onto the printout and sign it with their name to make it attributable to them. And at the end of each day, they photocopy all of the printouts and then manually type the results from every piece of paper into an electronic record. And of course, finally, the electronic record is reviewed by the supervisor to ensure A, that all the samples have been taken and B, that the data in the electronic record matches the printout. So it's an incredibly manual process with thousands of samples, lots of pieces of paper and manual data transcriptions. And the opportunity for human error to creep in and impact the integrity of the data is very high indeed. Now, the FDA aware of this and in their 2018 guidance on 21 CFR part 11 their question and answers paper that they published they stated that in recent years they've increasingly observed CGMP violations involving data integrity during their inspections and these violations of course have led to numerous regulatory actions including warning letters import alerts and even consent decrees and what they've said is that firms should be uh, implementing meaningful and effective strategies to manage their data integrity risks based on their knowledge of their understanding uh, sorry their knowledge and their understanding of their process and also uh, the, the use of technologies to help them with that now in their 2018 question and answer session uh, paper sorry uh, on interpreting their data integrity guidance, they introduced for the first time the acronym ALCOA, saying that a good electronic record, or sorry, in response to a question about what a good electronic record looks like, they said should be attributable, which is the first A in ALCOA, to the person taking the sample. They said it should be legible, which implies handwriting is probably not the right way to go. And it should be made contemporaneously or at the same time that the sample is taken rather than uh, later at a later time from paper printouts. And of course, the record should be the original record and the data it contains should be accurate. So let's take a look now on how we can um, automate our routine environmental monitoring programs to help improve the data integrity and reduce human error. With this particular particle counter on the screen here, you can see the accuracy is improved because the SOP sampling map from the SOP used on that site itself has been uploaded into the counter itself. Uh, and it's used to create an interactive version of the SOP sampling map in the counter itself. So the technician follows the map to the next sampling location and simply taps on the location on the map. The counter then automatically configures itself according to the SOP. The accuracy is improved now because there's nothing the technician has to do other than tap the run sample. There's no manual configuration or manual data entry required. And accuracy is further improved as the SOP version control is now done inside the counter itself. So you can see this SOP here version one and it's released and active in the counter. The administrators can log on remotely to the particle counter using a web browser. There's no special software required and they can configure an SOP and then release it using their electronic signature into the counter. The final electronic record is actually created contemporaneously inside the counter itself. 
The counter can give you paper printouts, but there's no need for paper printouts anymore. You get the electronic record straight from the particle counter using Wi-Fi or using uh, wired Ethernet. And the record contains a reference to the SOP name and the version number that was used on the day. So you know you're using the right ver SO version of the SOP. The user signs on using Microsoft Active Directory. So there's an electronic signature applied to the record. You can enter the production batch ID to tie the sample to the production batch. The location name is automatically populated because it's pre-programmed in the counter. The date and time is, of course, captured as is the configuration used in the counter, sampling results and the sample volume. Any alert and action alarms are also recorded in the electronic record and user comments are also recorded in the electronic record as well. To make sure that the records are accurate, uh, there is a review and a approve workflow in the counter itself. So the administrator or supervisor can log into the particle counters over their company network just using a web browser. There's no specialist software required. And the day sampling can be reviewed and approved for accuracy remotely via web browser, creating an electronic record with an electronic signature attached ready for export straight from the counter via Ethernet or Wi-Fi. And the final uh, workflow functionality in the counter that helps with improve the accuracy of the results or certainly underpin the accuracy is the integrated audit trail. And the audit trail contains um, the user ID of the person running the instrument, which as I said is controlled uh, using Microsoft Active Directory. Um, it also contains success and failure of user logins, when they logged in, when they logged out when the sample started, when the sample was completed, if somebody adds a new user um, or changes the user groups, that's all recorded there as well, as is changing a password as well for a local user. Um, if, pa if users are removed, that's captured, as is the calibration events. It, it, SOPs can be changed in there by the administrator only, um, and it records any changes to the SOPs or updates to new versions in the audit trail. Um, and of course, um, the instrument, uh, instrument configuration changes are also recorded in the audit trail. So you can see with this automated workflow, we've taken out a lot of the human error that causes those data integrity issues that we have. And that brings me to the end uh, of my session today. I hope you found it informative. I'd like to open up the floor now uh, to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Tony, for your informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, Tony, your first question is, Caesar says, thank you for your presentation. There are many particle counters available on the market. Please, can you summarize the key difference with your MET1 3400 Plus and how it helps improve data integrity? What makes a 3400 Plus different? Well, thank you for attending today. I appreciate the question. There are actually really four clear differences here. First and foremost, really, is the interactive SOP map on the screen. And this removes the need for the uh, technician to manually configure the counter. And of course, if you're removing manual steps, you're avoiding errors in the data or potential human error causing, causing the errors. The second thing is the electronic record itself is produced contemporaneously or at the time you make the measurement inside the counter. Uh, so this avoids data errors that can occur when you're, you're manually transcribing from the paper records, which we typically have, into electronic format. The third point, I guess, would be the accuracy of the data, which is confirmed by uh, the built-in review and approved workflow, which allows the supervisor to remotely review the data just using a web browser and to apply an electronic signature to the data. And finally, of course, the process of capturing the environmental monitoring samples can be reviewed itself to ensure there's no errors using the built-in audit trail. Great, thank you. 
All right, your next question. You show a remote review, an approved feature for the Met One. What software is required to, ask, to access the counter remotely, and how do you guarantee security? Uh, that's a good question. Thank you. So, in fact, you don't need any software to access the counter remotely. As long as the counter is connected to your company network, you can control SOP versions and review and approve data from your office simply using a web browser such as um, Google Chrome. Uh, security is assured as the user who logs on remotely must use their Microsoft Active Directory controlled username and password uh, via the web browser interface in order to browse the counter remotely. So that's how we keep it secure. Okay, and it looks like we have time for one last question. I can see that Microsoft Active Directory can help records be attributable, but why is it better than usernames and passwords created in the counter itself? Yeah, and that's a good question, really. And the reason that uh, typically regulators are looking for you to use uh, Microsoft Active Directory it gives you much more security. I mean, you can choose not to enable this feature and, and create local usernames and passwords in the counter itself, but the idea behind using Active Directory that it's A, enforces uh, the users to use the level of complexity defined by their corporate IT for their passwords and usernames, and B, and I think this is probably the most significant reason why it's encouraged, the use of Microsoft Active Directory is encouraged because it stops the use of generic passwords that all the technicians use on the counters because they don't want to remember yet another password. I mean, as you can imagine, in a fleet of particle counters, it won't take long before the password used on, the, on one counter gets out of sync with all the others, and you end up needing different passwords for different particle counters. So. It has been observed that quite common practice for teams to use a generic password, a single generic password for all of the particle counters. So all the team uses the same generic password. And of course, that removes the traceability of the sampling uh, completely. So using Active Directory avoids this as, if, as you only have to, A, first of all, remember the same password that you used to log on to your company computer, uh, and it B, it stops the use of these generic passwords. Thank you again, Tony, for your time today. Do you have any final comments for our audience before we go? Uh, no, I, I, I thank you for the opportunity to present today and, and thank you to the audience for attending. I hope that was informative. And um, if there are any more questions, perhaps you'd be kind enough to forward them on to me. Uh, I know we haven't got time today, but if you can forward them on to me, that would be great. And I'll try and answer them by email afterwards. Thank you. We'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd also like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Like Tony mentioned, any questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand, and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.